from Thomas Edison State University. This is Edison Soundstage. Good morning. My name is Dr. Joseph Youngblood II, and I am the Vice Provost and Founding Dean of the John S. Watson School of Public Service here at Thomas Edison State University. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the latest installment of the Public Service Leadership Studio on the Edison Soundstage. Joining us this morning are two extraordinary public servants and two national experts in the field of early childhood through secondary education, and in the development of programs and strategies for English language learners. Ana I. Berdesia is the Senior Fellow and Founding Director of the Center for the Positive Development of Urban Children here at Thomas Edison's Watson Institute for Public Policy and the Program Director for the New Jersey Cultural Competency and English Language Learners Summer Institute and Mentoring Program. Sandra G. B. Itubidez is Supervisor of ESL, Bilingual and World Language Programs for Secondary Schools for the Trenton Public School District serving more than 3,500 English language learners. Sandra brings over 25 years of experience as an educator and an advocate for biliteracy and equitable access to education for all children. Our guests this morning will lead us in a riveting discussion about emerging trends in the field of English language learning and talk specifically about the Cultural Responsive Pedagogy Program an innovative and impactful partnership between the Watson Institute for Public Policy and the Trenton Public Schools. Ana y Sandra, buenos dias y bienvenido a Public Service Leadership Studio. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. I, I found it really helpful to start these conversations with an opening context setting thought or idea. With that stated, and Anna, as you know, I served on the board of the Foundation for Child Development for a number of years. And FCD is the oldest foundation in America devoted specifically to the issues impacting and supporting positive child development. Over its 120 year history, FCD was a pioneer and led the way in commissioning extensive research on immigrants, dual language learners, and children from low income families who, as we know, face unique challenges in school and in life. What we discovered from this body of research and practice from FCD is that given the increasing number of children within these groups, there is a pressing need to understand the most effective instructional pedagogies, strategies, as well as social supports that can promote the cognitive, social, and emotional uh, well being and development uh, of children. Perhaps the most important finding of the FCD research is that new and innovative approaches must also view racial, ethnic, cultural, and linguistic diversity as assets that help children achieve their full potential. Yes. Getting society to understand that these factors are not deficits is essential to the parad uh, paradigmatic shifts that we need in the field. And so with that, um, Anna and uh, Sandra, if your opening comments can also provide us a brief reaction to that opening uh, thought and statement. Uh, and if you could take a few minutes to just uh, sort of frame that and frame your reaction for us as your opening statement. Well, Joe, I think the research is spot on because seldom do teachers have an opportunity to examine their teaching practices when it comes to the increasing number of English language learners and diverse children in their classroom. You can't walk into a classroom today and not see the diversity of students and the diversity of families that they represent. And our program has been instrumental in helping them use that cultural responsive lens to create culturally appropriate practices to engage English language learners and help them with their social emotional development as well as their academic. Yeah. So, uh, like uh, you well said, Joe, um, you know, I'm at the Trenton School District, and we have over 3,500 English language learners out of uh, a, a student population of 12,000 students. Therefore, like a third of the population are English language learners. And these uh, learners don't come with the same educational background. They come with different cultural experiences, different cultural backgrounds. They have different ability to adapt to learning environments, but through well-planned instruction 
these English language learners can attain the challenging academic grade level standards. Uh, but there are factors to consider, right? We have students that uh, are at grade level or above grade level in their native language, while others have interrupted education. They have also different abilities to adapt to different learning environments. So some of these kids, uh, because of their different personalities, can adapt to any classroom environment, but yet there are others that actually can feel disoriented or lost, especially if the learning environment is not a welcoming environment, if um, it's not a caring environment that actually acknowledges respects and celebrates their uh, diversity. So it's really important that through a cultural lens and perspective, our educators, our teachers are have the ability and the skill to actually reach uh, these students uh, through the specific learning strategies that this program offers. No, thank you both for those um, very uh, insightful comments um, to sort of frame where we're going with the discussion. Uh, and this issue of difference as deficit uh, is something that, again, we are continuing to see in the national landscape uh, and how that translates into this paradigmatic shift that I mentioned a few years ago is an essential part of why this work is so critical and so important, because it's not just about working with the kids and the teachers. It's about how society in general begins to understand and build this asset-based orientation. And with that, Anna, as a starting point, can you tell us um, a little about the Center for the Positive Development of Urban Children at uh, Thomas Edison, um, how the work began, and, and what led you uh, to this work? Well, when I started at the university 17 years ago, it's hard to believe that it's been so long. It truly I started is. <laughs> <laughs> I started to work with teachers that were trying to meet the Abbott mandate and they were trying to get their bachelor's degree and certification within a very small window of 3 to 4 years. And so as I started to advise teachers, they were talking about the diversity in their classroom and needing to fast track their degrees. And as I got to know the teachers more, they really identified that there was a gap in the professional development of teachers and that many coursework in teachers preparation programs did not have a course, just a subject matter within a course around culturally responsive practices and pedagogy. And so that got my brain going and we <laughs> developed the New Jersey Cultural Competency English Language Learner Learning Institute and mentoring program, which we didn't just want to give teachers content, we wanted to come alongside them and provide the mentoring and coaching so that they could move the needle on 26 uh, evidence-based practices that we find works from in any grade to help teachers engage English language learners and diverse students. Thank you, Anna. And I want to take a minute to say that uh, for our listeners uh, in the public service uh, studio who are noticing a trend of uh, a lot of the internal expertise that we feature on these podcasts, uh, it's because we have some extraordinary uh, talented people who are committed to the issues and the themes of public service in the work at the Watson Institute and also within the Watson School of Public Service. And I had the privilege as a young executive director over 20 years ago of being able to recruit Anna specifically to lead this body of work. Uh, Anna was uh, a renowned um, education practitioner and provider who made the translation into policy development that has again, put this work at the center of what we've been doing in New Jersey and around uh, the country. So Anna, thank you for that. Thank you for that leadership and thank you for that uh, brief overview of the work and the history of the work at, uh, at, at your center. Uh, Anna, can you talk about uh, what your role is at the Trenton Public Schools? Uh, what led you to that work? And again, just some of the transformative things that have been happening in the Trenton Public Schools. You mentioned the demographics. 20 years ago, when I started this work, there was a very different Trenton Public Schools. So we've had a rapid evolution in terms of the change in demography. What has that meant around these issues of pushing this cultural competency uh, and English language learning agenda? Uh, for one of the largest school districts in New Jersey? Uh, of course, with the increase in student population, uh, then we face a lot of challenges, right? So we, we are aware that we need to meet the needs of this large student population 
that come from diverse uh, cultural backgrounds. Uh, there is, uh, we need to increase our awareness of their needs. We also need to provide access to information in their native language so that parents and students can understand content while they learn uh, you know, to increase their English language proficiency. Uh, there is an increased awareness of that we need to hire more bilingual and biculturally trained professionals uh, to address the needs of our diverse student population. And of course, you know, there is an increased awareness of we need to increase professional development opportunities for all of our staff, K-12, so that they're equipped uh, adequately and appropriately to address the needs of all our students. Thank you, Sandra. And so ladies, can you give us a sense of how this partnership between Thomas Edison, the Watson Institute and the Trenton Public Schools uh, began, how it evolved and how it has led up to an extraordinary program that we know from looking at some of the longitudinal data is having a direct impact, both on the quality of professional development and teaching and learning, but also directly impacting students and their exploration of uh, their educational experiences in the Trenton Public Schools and beyond. Okay, well, Joe, we have the, the New Jersey Cultural Competency English Language Learner Learning Institute and mentoring program is 13 years old. And out of those 13 years, we have worked very successfully with Sandra and her team for the last four years, training 60, two educators and 12 school leaders in 12 school, 25 school leaders in 12 schools, got my, my numbers wrong. <laughs> and Sandra was identified very early on as a champion in the community, someone who really cared about English language learner and someone who really had her pulse on what teachers needed in terms of professional development. And as, as she mentioned, there is such a great need not to just put this in the hands of bilingual and ESL teachers, but to really saturate all educators with a cultural competency lens in which they teach and interact with students on a social emotional level as well as an academic level. And so we have build a program around three days of content, but then mentoring, going into the classroom for nine months to really model for teachers the way that they can infuse culture and language throughout the curriculum because teachers have been very skilled at bringing culture and language into literacy and social studies, but they have missed the mark in trying to bring culture and language into math, into science, into music and movement, into other, other content areas that can really help an English language learner and a, device stu and a diverse student feel welcome and feel like they're not invisible, that their culture and their language matters. And uh, Sandra, on the professional development side of this, uh, I know we put a tremendous amount of thought into what um, a mentoring uh, component to this program could look like. Can you tell us uh, from the voices of your colleagues how that support mechanism uh, mattered to them uh, as they embrace this sort of new way of thinking and engaging students around cultural competency? So I think research uh, is actually backing us up in the fact that uh, mentoring and coaching uh, adult learning is very effective. So teachers uh, receive the content, the information, the knowledge, they get to apply it. And then they have an expert in their classroom giving them that feedback and that guidance in the implementation of the strategies. That is, this is absolutely key. Uh, because you have an independent observer in the classroom that can then have those dialogues and discussions with the teacher and, uh, you know, makes the teacher reflect on their own instructional practice to see how effective it is and how they are addressing the needs of their learners. Uh, and I have to highlight that these 62 educators span throughout K-12 classrooms in our district and uh, not only in bilingual uh, classrooms, they are also in general education classrooms because we know that these English language learners uh, differ. They may be close to English language proficiency, 
These students may be sitting in general education classrooms while others are just learning to, uh, you know, acquire English and they're sitting in bilingual classrooms. Others midway are in general ed classrooms and have a ESL English as a second language support. So it's a wide range of students that we're talking about that are in every single classroom in our district, K-12. So definitely the coaching and mentoring model is uh, it's a, a model and, a, and an example for our teachers to follow and be effective. And, and let's build on that. I want to stay with you, uh, Sandra, here to have you also then to talk about how this has translated into outcomes, uh, improved outcomes for the district, uh, for the students, and again, what that broader linkage to the community and the parents. Uh, and the first a native tongue of uh, many of the students that are coming uh, to, to our district. So what has that represented for you in terms of what you've seen across the span of the 13 years that we've been partnering in this project? Well, the gains, uh, first of all, from the teacher perspective is they're, they're feeling uh, confident, their efficacy uh, in delivering instruction that is meaningful for, for students. The second gain, I would say, is student engagement and participation in the classroom. When these students feel that there is a connection to self and community and home, they feel valued, they feel acknowledged, and definitely they're more engaged and there is a buying in uh, from students as well as parents. I recall that a lot of the projects uh, that teachers engage students in, uh, also there's parent uh, participation. So we're bringing in that parent participation component that is key, that research tells us is one of the factors that can contribute to student success in schools, right? Um, as at the level of school wide, I would say that there's an increased awareness that we need to do more, that we need to be better equipped to address the needs of our diverse student population, and that we need to acknowledge and accept the fact that our demographics are changing. And therefore, we need to change our recruitment practices and our instructional practices in the classroom to be more successful. Thank you. No, a uh, phenomenal uh, set of uh, sort of practices uh, relative to what we know to be best practices and how we need to, again, continue to push that evolution. Uh, Anna, can you give us a sense of what the day in the life is of, let's say, uh, a new participant in the program? Uh, how's the program structured? What are the uh, added effects of the program that, again, are designed to both support uh, the development of their teaching and learning, but also their understanding of the issues? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, when we look at um, how people of different backgrounds uh, and linguistic histories from the kids we're working with um, can play an impact, as uh, Sandra said, either in enabling or supporting their development or being an impediment, uh, I would think that's a critical issue. So how was the program constructed? And give us a sense of what it's like as a teacher to be in this program. All right, well, we start the program with the pretest. Before they actually come to our three-day institute, we'll do a classroom observation, almost like a picture in time. What was there before they actually started to unpack what culturally responsive pedagogy is? And then throughout the program, we do three post assessments. So we can take another picture in time and see where the teacher has made improvements. And what we find is that the classroom design has changed significantly. We have teachers said, before your program, my, my classroom had no culture. Now you can come into my classroom and know who's in the room by what's in the room. Um, national flags, globes, uh, artwork that represents families, writings, children's immigration stories posted on the walls, um, artifacts from their families that create a fantastic uh, cultural gallery, artwork, um, the library books. Now you're seeing books that reflect every child in the classroom, literacy projects that link into math and science. We have a high school uh, teacher who was kind of, I'm not sure how I'm going to fit this cultural responsive practice into math. And we give all our participants $500 worth of cultural materials to reinvent their classroom and their practices. And he bought a, a Mayan 
encyclopedia. And now he's using, using the Mayan calendar and Mayan symbols and numbers to excite the high school students about math concepts, geometry and trigonometry. And so his confidence, as Sandra mentioned, has, has increased and he feels like he can add so much value by connecting history and math to the culture and language of his students. Excellent uh, illustration. And uh, Anna is about to get embarrassed because I know every time I mention this story, uh, she sort of grimaces and shakes her head. Uh, but the Watson Institute was created as a very unique uh, public policy institute dealing with uh, urban issues here in New Jersey. My premise as a policy professional is that the best policies, those that are more culturally responsive, uh, those that are developmentally appropriate and contextually unique, come from people who have a core and fundamental understanding of what these issues are from the perspective of the people that they are advocating for. So with that, when I recruited Anna to the Watson Institute, she was pretty clear that she was a, uh, an expert in the field, a practitioner. And she said, well, Joe, I can tell you, I don't know very much about public policy. And I said, Anna, all I need you right now to know is what are the effective characteristics uh, of early care and education programs? Translating that into policy will come for you. It will come naturally and easily. And boy, has it done that in terms of her representation uh, on just about every major uh, policy um, committee, uh, board, or task force uh, in the state of New Jersey across the span of the 17 years that she's been here. So with that, ladies, what can we begin to think about as we look at the policy implications of what this longitudinal research now for the last 13 years is telling us about best practices? How can we begin to now shape the policy conversation at the larger state and national level so that a lot of the interesting and innovative ideas that have been created as a result of this work can come to fruition and impact kids now on a larger scale beyond just what we're doing in Trenton, beyond what we're doing in New Jersey. So can you talk about that uh, for a minute for us? Well, definitely, Sandra hit that. Uh, one of the major ones that we uh, promote with our school leaders, the need for continuing professional development around culturally responsive practice. It is not a one and done approach. You go to this great three-day institute, you're mentored for nine months, and then bingo, you have this, the magic bullet to becoming a culturally conscious and responsive educator. It's, it's uh, an invitation to continue to engage them in those difficult conversations about race and equity and inclusion and helping parents as well as students feel that they're part of the learning community and that they can contribute to the learning community in meaningful ways. Also another policy uh, recommendation would be to have the, the students inform the teachers, having focus groups with students and parents to say, what's missing in this cultural linguistic environment? What would add value to the participants versus uh, it being driven by teacher-directed activities or curriculum-based models versus really you have a captive audience where you can ask them what they want and what they need. And that is something that we um, encourage school leaders to really tap into those resources. Sandra, you wanna add? Yes, definitely. I wanna chime in because I think um, nowadays, one of the things that we need the most is really to listen to one another to come together as a community and learn from each other, right? Adding all those different cultural perspectives and sharing our experiences and our feelings can really bring us together uh, and share our you know, common elements that we have and acknowledge our differences as well. So uh, I think it is critical that these conversations start taking place, that we're honest and transparent about them and that together with everybody at the table, we can find solutions so that we can move forward and really support our students to have a better future in a community that is inclusive, that acknowledges them, that cares for them and helps them to be successful in a very diverse world. Thank you. And policy professionals, by uh, the definition of the role, have to be uh, opportunistic and uh, exploitive. 
And so with that, I want to talk briefly about one of the policy issues and concerns that I have as someone who has been in and around this space in terms of looking at uh, the issues around maximizing the educability uh, of immigrant families and uh, children and families um, who are English language learners. And you both mentioned at several points throughout the podcast this important intersection of family, parents, and community. So I think New Jersey has been uh, lagging behind a lot of other states in response to the need for two generation strategies or dual generation programs. Can you talk about that aspect of where there may be potential opportunities in terms of next level programming that could engage parents and families more directly? in terms of these issues and themes that we're talking about within this genre? Absolutely, I, I agree that we are just inching into that two generational approach with parents. And through our program, we have seen that for parents, you just have to make an invitation and they are there. They're there as literacy readers. They're there as co-teachers teaching children about uh, their culture and their um, cultural journey to the United States. Um, in When we used to work in Montclair, we had an Egyptian parent come in her attire, Egyptian dress and taught the kids how to write their names with the Egyptian symbols and told the children about what their heritage is. And it's just really amazing. And, and what pride a child feels when their parent is leading a discussion in their very classroom and they're giving them a high five and they're smiling at your mom. You know, it's really a wonderful way to build that homeschool connection. I definitely want to support what you just said, Anna. And what comes to my mind is the project of the Cinderella story in the third uh, uh, bilingual classroom at Grant Elementary School where we have our dual language program. And when you, Joe, when you mentioned programming, that's what came to my mind, is having actually uh, in the dual language that we have, uh, the bilingual program that we have in Trenton is uh, Spanish, uh, but the dual language is having actually a two-way dual language program, having gen, general ed uh, English uh, dominant students together with those Spanish speaking students learning about each other's culture, about each other's language. So as, as pro programming uh, is referred, I would uh, definitely support the two way dual language program, having those parents come together and, and understand one another culturally and, and learn each other's uh, languages. Uh, you know, throughout the world, when you go to Europe, uh, it's, uh, you know, there are no borders. People speak two, three, four different languages. Absolutely. I think we need to increase that awareness that it's a world without borders, you know. Uh, we need to encourage uh, learning different languages, looking at the world with different lenses and perspectives that allow us to understand uh, one another better. Uh, and uh, I recall in that classroom, Anna, and maybe yes. you can chime in uh, with that, there were a couple of African-American children that all of a sudden they had to write a Cinderella story. They said, well, we don't have one, right? But they were able to go home, talk to their parents, find out about their cultural heritage that they discovered, and they were able to write their own Cinderella story. And, and that was, it was just amazing. The parents came to the school, there was a celebration, they shared the stories. And it, it's a way for a child really to deep uh, down, go into their cultural roots, right? It's part of our identity. And we're not just talking, you know, uh, food and, and music. It's, it's about our values. It's about where we come from and who we are and how we're projecting ourselves into the world. So it's, it, it's a lot of deep conversation and finding out really uh, our identity ourself and how we're uh, evolving as individuals. So it's a really important work and I can't be uh, 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 honored to be working with Anna that she's such a role model uh, for our educators and our community. And she has brought so much to our district through this program. We're very grateful. So meaningful and thank you. The Cinderella story. Um, Joe, this is such a, a cute project and that Sandra, thank you for reminding me. The kids interviewed their parents and wrote a Cinderella story for their culture. And there was about 20 kids in this dual language. So there was stories from, from 
Libya, from Nigeria, from Guatemala. And there was a one little boy from Trenton. And he says, but I'm not a girl. I don't want to be Cinderella. So his <laughs> Cinderella story was a little boy named Cinder who grew up in the city of Trenton in an urban area. And he described Trenton and he had all the the components of the Cinderella story, but it had an urban lens. And it was just amazing to hear him read it in front of his peers and the parents and celebrate Trenton as his culture. Oh, that that's exciting. And to be in and around this work or to have been in, in and around it for the last uh, 13 years and to see the growth and the development and the evolution of the teachers and to hear the stories about the kids is so exciting. And uh, Anna, I think in this phase of the Institute's development, we're committed to making sure that we're getting this information out there so that it can be shared and people can understand and appreciate the richness of that. So I really thank both of you ladies for your passion and for your commitment to this. Uh, two closing uh, thoughts and then a question. Uh, the first is let's be slightly prognosticative here and also uh, romanticize the fact that after this podcast goes live, you all are gonna start getting calls from philanthropies and corporate uh, entities who want to sponsor the program and what I will call the next phase of the development and evolution of the program. What would those, what would those expansion areas look like? What do you see as the next it, the next part, if you will, of this program that can enhance the opportunities, enhance the learning, and more importantly, enhance the outcomes and the impact on children, families, and communities. Well, I have a wish list, Joe. Well, <laughs> How long is the podcast? <laughs> Uh, we had the pleasure of working maybe two years ago, I believe, Sandra, with one school, uh, Martin Luther King Elementary School, and they have a large uh, population of English language learners. We took, uh, we had our regular summer cohort, and then we had a fall cohort with 15 teachers at MLK, and that was specifically to help teachers develop their own learning community. So we were there for a year and a half, and we have 15 teachers that are sharing their experiences. And when you develop a program, you, you want it to take root so that when you exit a program, that the, the remains and the, the insight, the best practices are still alive and well when you leave. And this community, as we've gone, um, we hired a consultant to go back a year later to see these classrooms and all the evidence of those 26 strategies that we taught and promoted are still alive and well in those 15 classrooms that we visited. I really would love to see that expand in the district, not only to bilingual centers, but you know, to every single school. And like I said before, I would love to see an increase uh, awareness and interest in parents of English dominant uh, population uh, to be part of bilingual dual language uh, programming. I think uh, it, is, it is something that we should pursue as a district. Uh, and, and acknowledge that we live in this world now without borders that we need to expand the capacity of our students to be successful um, in, in a wider you know, world. Um, so uh, both programming and definitely instructional practices that are benefit every single student, not only those that come from other countries, but uh, kids that are here with us uh, you know, in, in, in America, so both. For me. Oh, thank you. And perhaps the closing thought, and I'll ask this of uh, Sandra because I think Anna did such a great job of this, really embellishing and deconstructing the Cinderella uh, story that she provided. But uh, I'm a qualitative researcher, so I absolutely love the qualitative narratives. And so, Sandra, can you give us what you think is one rich example of the transformative? Um, nature of what this program has done either for a teacher, a parent, a school, or even the school district in terms of just something uh, that, um, you know, just created uh, this sort of emotional reaction to you because you were able to see uh, the, the, the direct and immediate impact of the work that you were engaged in. So we have several, several examples. And like Anna said, we with 62 educators spanning K to 12 and uh, impact to 2,800 students K to 12. Uh, I have shared many stories uh, through pictures, visuals, examples of projects that teachers constantly share with us. And we share 
to our other staff uh, through our uh, bilingual updates uh, in the district. So I, I think I wanna highlight the enthusiasm and the uh, excitement created with uh, through this program, uh, you know, to our educators and to engage our students in uh, staying in school, doing the work, uh, attending uh, daily, even though we're virtual, and that has been challenging. But if the teacher is able to use uh, cultural, instructional, appropriate practices, they are able to hook that student to stay in school and to stay engaged and, and, and learn. Um, and it comes to my mind, Anna, uh, we've had some teachers that, you know, that during this virtual setting is this, uh, uh, just last week, a teacher shared with me that, yes, uh, I am still being mentored and coached through the program. And this, I have seen it to be successful and productive during the virtual setting to make sure that kids are engaged and attending uh, school, right? I even had a teacher that has attended on a, your program uh, several times. And she even during the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration had a virtual cultural celebration that included students and parents alike. So uh, we have both the students and the parent engagement that are uh, key factors uh, in making sure that our kids are successful. Yes, absolutely. And I want to add that not only are we are we impacting the social emotional development of children, we are also impacting the well being of teachers, we had several teachers that have felt that the teaching. This is my last year, I'm going to get out of here. This is so stressful. And we have been able to re energize them and help them stay longer and help you know, I should have been in this program years ago, if I had only been in this program years ago, I would have had less stress. I would have figured out what strategies support my student and also alleviate the stress of teaching. Wow, that is incredible. Uh, this has been an extraordinary, uh, insightful conversation about uh, an issue that is so important to the future of America and to the future of the world. Uh, and certainly given what we have seen as we come out of this historic election in America, this issue of understanding that we are all Americans, we all have a right to that American dream and making sure that we're creating opportunities for everyone to be a full participant uh, in society and in education, I think is essential to achieving that objective. So I wanna thank both of you again. Uh, I was not being hyperbolic or overly gratuitous in my opening statement when I said that we have two extraordinary public servants here today, because we absolutely do. Uh, this work that you've done is often uh, behind the scenes. And so it's been our pleasure to try to create this platform and this medium to elevate this work so that people can see and understand what's going on and how important this work is. So I want to extend my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to you. Uh, we are prepared, uh, Sandra, to continue this partnership uh, with our local school district. Uh, our work at the Watson Institute has a statewide orientation, but we've always been clear about our commitment to home base. And so we want to make sure that we're continuing opportunities uh, for Anna and other colleagues at the Watson Institute to have this direct focus and impact on what's happening uh, in our home city here. And again, we thank you and all of your colleagues for the work that you do every day uh, for the students of Trenton and for our community. Uh, with that, thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, we are excited uh, to continue to uh, host these podcasts. Again, it's been another interesting opportunity of how we can translate this COVID period uh, into new innovative structures and strategies. And that's really what this podcast series represents for us here at the Watson Institute and the Watson School of Public Service. So thank you all. And we look forward to having you at uh, another podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to our collaboration. Yes. Thank you.